Hello, we continue our journey through the art and monuments of the ancient world by examining one of the major civilizations of the classical world in the Mediterranean region. We start in ancient Greece, which is a broad term referring to a number of different city-states and their surrounding areas. There was not a singular Greek empire for much of its history, but city-states did share religious beliefs and language, among other social and cultural elements. This map helps us comprehend how widespread the Greek settlement was and how the major Greek city-states were surrounded by and greatly dependent upon the sea. The rocky, mountainous terrain of the mainland pushed settlement towards the coastlines and onto neighboring islands and lands of Asia Minor, now modern-day Turkey. Despite the spread-out nature of Greek settlement, incredible achievements in art, literature, philosophy, mathematics, and of course seafaring techniques developed throughout this geographic expanse. One of the major differences between ancient Greece and the civilizations of ancient Mesopotamia and ancient Egypt is the importance placed upon the human form. The statement by the early Greek philosopher Protagoras sums up approaches to politics, art, and even religion in ancient Greece. Man is the measure of all things. The individual human is supreme over all else, including kings and gods. As a result of this belief, the physical traits of the human body, the emotional and psychological experiences of people, and the relationships between individuals and society are given tremendous value. Political systems, especially those in the powerful city-state of Athens, emphasize the needs and desires of people through representative government. Artworks and monuments reflect the celebration of the idealized human anatomy and proportion. And the religious beliefs imagined the gods and goddesses to exhibit common human characteristics, giving them human forms and strengths, but even subjecting them to the same flaws and weaknesses people demonstrate. Even though human beings are important, the gods and goddesses of the Greek religious pantheon are some of the most common subjects in artworks. They are often depicted with perfect or ideal human physical qualities, with an emphasis on symmetry and balance to promote harmony. Unlike the type of symmetry found in ancient Egyptian sculpture, what we see with Greek sculpture is the use of contrapposto, a posture in the human body that creates balance through the counterweight of hips and shoulders moving in opposite directions. We will also look at the architectural monuments the ancient Greeks built in the forms of temples to the gods. Finally, we will see their impressive use of materials such as marble and bronze and the new construction methods and techniques they mastered. The developments of art and architecture in ancient Greece are divided up into different periods. The earliest period of artistic creation we will view is termed the geometric period, named for the prevalence of geometric forms and the designs on pottery and other objects from around 900 to 700 BCE. During this time, major city-states were forming and major cultural developments were occurring as well, including the codification of the Greek alphabet and script, and the composition of epic poems and literature. In art, the geometric period is characterized by symbolic forms, where lines and geometric shapes are used to represent bodies and beings. Scenes of animals, soldiers, warriors, and other heroic individuals are common motifs on objects ranging from terracotta vases to bronze vessels, and sculpture made from wood or stone. This funerary vase, called a crater, was used to mark a grave, which makes sense when you consider the funerary scene portrayed on its surface. The scene in front of us is a funeral, with the deceased laid horizontally upon the platform, or pier. Individuals flank the deceased on either side, shown in sequence with their arms raised above their heads in a sign of mourning. Below them, horses, soldiers, and armor are shown, perhaps referring to the military experience of the deceased. These scenes are separated by horizontal bands of pigment and design. 
creating a highly decorative work that guides our eyes to the central activities of the piece. Although we already see an interest in portraying human forms and living creatures in the geometric period, it is within the archaic period that artworks take on more naturalistic qualities. During this time, there is increasing contact and cultural exchange between the Greek city-states and the civilizations of Egypt and the eastern edges of the Mediterranean. Construction of religious monuments and sculptures grew in number and size revealing the influence of foreign artistic trends. Simultaneously, the archa archaic period is known as a time when the citizens of different city-states came together for pan-Hellenic, meaning across all of Greece, activities, such as athletic competitions and festivals. Generally, the archaic period is considered a time when cultural practices flourished, when artists Philosophers, scholars, and scientists pioneered significant concepts and calculations. During this time, we see a marked increase in the production of large freestanding sculpture, often constructed in life scale or even monumental scale. These two sculptures reveal the influence of Egyptian freestanding sculpture, with static postures that emphasize strength through the vertical and symmetrical designs. The standing youth, or male koros, on the left displays the youthful, athletic body idealized by the Egyptians. Only this figure is shown fully nude in admiration and celebration of the perfect physical contours of the body. In contrast, the female kora on the right is fully clothed, with parallel lines symbolizing the pleats of her fabric, suggesting realistic weight and movement in a more abstracted manner. Both sculptures have the calm, content facial expressions characteristic of archaic statues, with the female Cora displaying the famous closed mouth archaic smile. These statues are some of the earliest naturalistic three-dimensional works, but they are not representative of specific individuals. Instead, the postures, proportions, and other features were fairly standardized throughout this time, making it easy to recognize works from the archaic period. It is also during this time that we begin to see specific artists named, sometimes with large workshops and specific styles associated with them. In this example, we have a vase made by the artist Ezekias known for his mastery of the black figure technique. The scene depicted is much more naturalistic than the vase from the geometric period, not only for its treatment of the human body and other forms, but also for the psychological component involved in the subject matter. The artist shows us the figure of Ajax, a hero from the Trojan War, in the moments before his suicide. Ezekiel silhouettes Ajax against a bright orange background, giving the scene both visual and emotional intensity. Ajax was distraught after not receiving the armor of the famous hero Achilles upon his death and goes into a delusional rage where he kills a herd of cattle thinking the animals were enemies on the battlefield. Ashamed at his destruction and loss of control, he chooses to fall upon his sword and kill himself. As viewers, we see a moment when he has already made his choice to take his life and is placing his sword firmly in the earth to accomplish this task. Choosing this specific moment, I think, is the most fascinating part of this image. The viewer would likely know the story well, and thus would know the terrible fate that awaits Ajax. The viewer completes the narrative in their minds, spurred by this image. The emotional weight of knowing the tragedy before and after this moment would awaken the sympathies of the viewer, emphasizing their human capacity and ability to relate to the hero shown in front of them. During the classical period of Greek art, we begin to see some significant changes in the treatment of the human body. We see the increased use of marble and bronze for freestanding sculpture, and a new attention to detail regarding the movements and shapes of the human anatomy. 
It is during this time that Athens became the dominant city-state throughout Greece, leading a confederation to maintain the independence of Greek city-states against any future military threat from the nearby Persian Empire to the east. In Athens, expensive and grand building projects were pursued under the leadership of Pericles in the 5th century BCE, often called the Golden Age of Greece. As we see, bronze was the preferred material for large freestanding sculpture. This example shows two sides of the statue called Reace Warrior A, one of the two bronze warriors found in 1972 submerged off the coast of Riace in modern Italy. The Riace warriors are life-size, bronze, and nude, both showing the same bearded facial features and muscular bodies that we see on statue A here. Instead of the vertical static posture of Egyptian or archaic sculpture, this warrior displays contrapposto, a stance where one knee is bent which causes the hips of the person to dip down on one side and rise up on the other. To counter this movement in the lower body, the upper body will often display movement of the chest, arms, or shoulders in the opposite direction of the hips, creating a sense of harmony and balance, even without symmetry. In the Classical period, the Acropolis of Athens gained important significance as the highest point in the center of the growing and prosperous city. This plateau housed the treasury of the city and several administrative and religious functions as well. Most prominent is the large marble temple you can see dominating the skyline and physical area, the Parthenon. This image shows the three main architectural orders used in the ancient classical world. The Doric order on the far left and the Ionic order in the middle were the main stylistic orders of architecture during the classical period, whereas the Corinthian order on the right was more popular with the Roman architects. The Doric order is characterized by a wider base and thinner top in the columns topped with a more geometric and simplistic system of horizontal and vertical sections until you reach the triangular roof. The spaces between the top of the column and the roof, called the entablature, and the top of the entablature and the roof, called the pediment, were areas usually covered with sculpted decorations. The Ionic order is characterized by a thinner column with fluted exteriors similar to the Doric columns but the column is topped with a scroll pattern as well. Above the capital is a space called the frieze, which allowed for sculpted decoration as well. The Parthenon is one of the longest lasting and most impressive achievements of classical Greek architecture. It is a key example of the Doric order with its fluted columns made up of several round marble segments placed on top of each other, called drums. Surprisingly, it was constructed in less than nine years. Dedicated to the patron goddess of Athens, Athena, this structure served as a monumental temple to her, housing a large gold and ivory statue of the goddess in the middle of the building upon its completion. Today, the Parthenon is a testament to the workmanship of the ancient Greeks, especially the architects Ictinos and Callicrates. The measurements of the building were created from standardized lengths, widths, and proportions derived from the human body. It is designed to be perfectly symmetrical and harmonious, exhibiting the kind of beauty and balance the Athenians prided themselves on. The pediment and frieze once contained incredibly detailed marble sculptures of Athenian citizens participating in processions and festivals, half human and half beach, beast creatures fighting with men, and other tales from Greek mythology, providing a visual array of men and gods sharing the decorative space. Many of these sculptures are housed in the British Museum in London, known collectively as the Elgin Marbles after Lord Elgin, who studied them 
and removed them from Athens in the 19th century. As you can see from this view of the facade of the Parthenon, the building appears to create perfect horizontal and vertical lines. In fact, the floor of the temple is raised slightly in the center to compensate for what's known as the illusory sag that would appear to exist in the center if the floor were actually perfectly flat. In this way, we see the Greeks calculate and construct this monument to portray the visual experience of perfection, showing a sophisticated understanding of how things would appear and how to manipulate that appearance for aesthetic preferences. Everything about classical Greece stresses this kind of visual perfection, and anything otherwise would have been deemed ugly and barbaric. The beginning of the Hellenistic period in ancient Greece is ironically marked by the end of another important time, the reign of Alexander the Great. Before he died in 232 BCE, Alexander the Great expanded the reach of Greek culture with his military victories stretching from mainland Greece through Asia Minor, Egypt, the Persian Empire, and all the way to modern India. Upon his death, Alexander's generals divided this enormous stretch of land into several independent dynasties, all sharing prominent elements of Greek culture and helping to spread the stylistic features of Hellenistic art and culture broadly. The rise of Hellenistic art coincided with the formation of institutions that recorded history, including the earliest forms of museums and libraries. As such, Hellenistic artworks often portrayed historical content, such as military victories and defeats, just as much as religious or mythological content. Wealthy individuals and political elites began collecting both original works and copies of Greek sculptures from earlier periods, expanding the audience and demand for Greek art and encouraging artists to experiment with new ways of showing familiar subject matter. Here we have Aphrodite of Melos. Discovered on the island of Melos in 1820, she is believed to be Aphrodite, the goddess of love, who is often shown in partial nudity. The female nude body receives as much interest as the male nude body, with attention to realistic contours and shapes. She stands in contrapposto, with her knee bent and her hips tilted. Her drapery appears wet, clinging to her body, as if it may fall at any moment. The sculpture is constructed from two blocks of marble, segmented into several pieces, arms, torso, legs, etc., then assembled by being fixed together with vertical pegs, a construction method also used to attach the many drums of marble together to create the columns of the Parthenon. Aphrodite once was beautifully colored and adorned with metal jewelry to make her appear more lifelike. Her facial features and physical attributes make her stunningly realistic, considering that she's made of marble. Her passive expression recalls the placid gaze and smile of the archaic sculptures but her shapely body and naturalistic treatment are hallmarks of the innovative style of the Hellenistic period. One of the most dramatic examples of Hellenistic sculpture is called the Loakwan and his sons, a monumental sculptural group that is now housed in the Vatican museums in Rome. It is believed to be a marble copy of an earlier bronze sculpture said to have depicted a priest named Loakwan and his two sons as they are overcome and killed by giant snakes. The statue itself was discovered in 1506 in Rome, and legend has it that the great Renaissance sculptor Michelangelo was on site during its excavation. It was instantly recognized as a beautiful remnant of the Hellenistic style of Greek art. The sculpture is over eight feet in height and made up of seven interlocking pieces of marble, similar to the segmented assembly of the Aphrodite of Melos. Unlike the passive, quiet, and calm beauty of Aphrodite, Loakoan and his sons display agony and horror, 
and their bodies twist and bend in response to the writhing movements and force of the snakes surrounding them. Like the scene of Ajax's suicide, viewers see the moment of the story that confirms the fatal ending they anticipate. Viewers would likely have known the story of Luakoan since he was described in the work Aeneid by Virgil, and thus would know the outcome of the struggle between man and beast. Seeing the tortured faces and bodies of these figures only makes it more agonizing to view, tugging at the emotions of the viewer. There's nothing to be done to end the suffering and prevent the gruesome deaths. Even as we watch them suffer, the physical and emotional experiences of man are the central themes of this work. Throughout the hundreds of years of ancient Greek artwork and the progression of its styles, the centrality of human experience is constant throughout. This concludes our lecture on ancient Greece.